Australia is an immigration nation, but a hundred years ago, this wasn't the plan. The Commonwealth of Australia was built on a paradox. The paradox was they were going to realise a utopia, but they were going to do it through excluding the vast majority of humanity. From 1901, this meant tough restrictions on immigration, the white Australia policy. We would be an exclusively white community. There would be no one in Australia other than members of the white race. This was the objective. But by the 1960s, a new generation questioned the exclusion of our Asian neighbours. These Australian students, they're not prepared to play the game. They're not prepared to judge whether someone should enter Australia because of the colour of their skin. The kidnap of a six-year-old girl exposed the injustice of a racist system. Nancy is being deported on the basis of one criterion alone, and that's colour. But it took the Vietnam War and a humanitarian crisis to force the country to banish the ideal of a white Australia once and for all. We're leaving our country. If we die, if we perish, at least we, as the whole family, we die together. This is the secret history of us. How modern multicultural Australia was achieved against the odds. Ironically, the final chapter of how Australia became the immigration nation we live in today was only possible because of the terrifying threat of Asian communism. The events of the 1950s seemed to show that communism in Asia was expansionary. And so Australia is seen as the, the ultimate destination of those falling dominoes, that the gravity uh, would see them Communism moved through China, through Southeast Asia, and threatened Australia. Today, five sixths of Europe and Asia are under the iron heel of communism. And one of the biggest prizes of all, Australia. Be assured they will not remain indifferent to the wealth this country can provide. Australia's a prosperous nation of 8 million. The country is 99% white, thanks to tight immigration controls designed to keep anyone who isn't white out. To protect white Australia, Prime Minister Menzies sends troops to fight communism in Korea and Malaya. But in 1950, he also signs up to a plan to counter communism in a very different way. The Colombo Plan was an attempt to create in Southeast Asia uh, and South Asia a bloc uh, against the communist, this communist advance. Extraordinarily, one of the key features of the Colombo plan means Menzies will resist communism, not by keeping Asians out, but by letting them in. University campuses across Australia will be transformed. A crucial dimension of the Colombo plan related to issues of education, educating Asians to play important roles in their societies and hopefully resist communism. And so the Australian government saw bringing Asian students to Australia as an important part of the plan. But it also had another motivation, and that was that these people could experience Australia, see that Australians are not racist, and return uh, essentially as ambassadors of white Australia, at least defending uh, the policy. But as Asian students arrive, it seems the intention for them to become advocates of a white Australia may be a little optimistic. What do Asian students tell their friends who ask about the white Australia policy? And it is the white Australia policy that's mentioned. Yeah, the Australians tend to be, uh, tend to be uh, a friendly nation towards us, and yet uh, 
You know, why do they have the white Australia policy? The Colombo Plan was never going to achieve the hopes that Robert Menzies had hoped for. It. it wasn't ever going to be that magic bullet that would inoculate the white Australia policy against Asian criticism. Not only will Menzies' great plan fail in its key aim, it has ironic and unintended consequences for white Australians. John Menadieu leaves his home in rural South Australia and enrolls at Adelaide University in 1953. On his first day, he's told he'll be sharing a room with three Malayan students. I was just stunned. I grew up knowing nothing else but uh, basically white and Caucasian people. We didn't even have Chinese restaurants in the country towns of South Australia. I guess the main view that I had at that time was that Asians were poor people, they were badly educated, and they'd be something of a threat to this country. But even a man with prejudice gets hungry. So when John's new roommates share their dinner with him, the tension begins to break down. It was my introduction to uh, Asian food, curry, rice and things which I'd never really, I'd only eaten rice as a, as a dessert, never as a part of a main course. I found that these Asian students were well educated, spoke extremely good English and were very pleasant people to know. Rather than Asians discovering the virtues of white Australia, Australians are realising the charm of their new Asian neighbours. And indeed, in some suburbs around universities, landladies would put up signs saying, uh, room available, Asian students only, because they'd come to see Asian students as a better tenant than, than many Australian students of the time. I could see that white Australia was abhorrent. It was not in Australia's uh, interest uh, and that we needed to change and those, that experience with those Asian students was uh, very much a part of that. A changed man, John Menadieu joins the University ALP Club, where he meets kindred spirits. One of the brightest stars is Don Dunstan, a young lawyer newly elected to the South Australian Parliament. He was smarter than anyone else on the Conservative side. He was also smarter than many people in the Labor Party and that caused some resentment as well. But we admired him for his ability and his general stance uh, on public issues. And he was a, a great reformer. Don Dunstan was important uh, because he is representative of this new generation of uh, Labor politicians who come to the ALP with a social democratic agenda. The fact that the ALP national platform still has a commitment to the White Australia policy is seen by the likes of Dunstan as incredible. Dunstan and Menadieu's views are shared by the up-and-coming Gough Whitlam. But it seems these young firebrands won't stand a chance against bipartisan support for White Australia. As well as Prime Minister Menzies, even the deputy leader of their own party, Arthur Caldwell, is against them. In a very real sense, Bob Menzies and Arthur Caldwell had more in common with each other when it came to their attitudes about migration and what sort of Australia you know, should, be, should be maintained than either of them had with the younger guard in their own parties. There's a gulf there and it's a generational gulf, it's not a political gulf. The old guard, Menzies, Corwell, and others of that generation were not persuaded one iota that there was a need for fundamental change. For them, it was axiomatic, it couldn't be challenged. It was like a law of nature that you couldn't mix races. If you mixed races, you end up with trouble. Throughout the 1950s, it's clear what kind of country Australia wants to be. In the last decade, the government has imported a million migrants from Europe, half of them British. Dad's taking me to Australia. 
He says that's the best place for me to get on in life. You too can go to Australia for £10. Inquire now at your local employment exchange or at Australia House, London. The £10 POM scheme helps keep Australia white. We came here from Britain three years ago. We are so very happy that we are bringing out another British family to give them the same chance we got. As Prime Minister Menzies and Arthur Caldwell go head to head in the federal election of 1961, students target the campaign to force their protest against white Australia onto the agenda. This is Melbourne University, which is the headquarters of Student Action. Now, Student Action was perhaps the first public demonstration of some general disquiet or unease felt by young people in this country about certain aspects of our migration policy. Well, first of all, I think it's just plain unfair that people should be discriminated against just because of their skin colour. I mean, it's immoral. It gets Australia very bad publicity in the eyes of the world. I think that white Australia is a slap in the face for Asian peoples, and therefore there's no point in making um, uh, enemies overseas. These Australian students saw the white Australia policy as a cause to be championed, as an aspect of Australian society that was outdated and had to change and they were going to attempt to change it. They're not prepared to play the game. They're not prepared to judge whether someone should enter Australia because of the colour of their skin. Have you heard the politicians make their stand? Want to keep the budget right? Want to keep Australia white? Oh, there's mean things happening in this land. But Caldwell and Menzies have no time for radicals or change. Neither do many Australians. Well, I think that they should keep it white as much as possible. I think that there's no uh, two ways about it. We'd soon become outnumbered here if we allowed um, Asiatics in. Their ways and habits are so far different to ours. Once you open that little crack in the door and in they come, the minute you let them in, you're going to finish up, you're going to overrun with them. The 1961 election campaign ends with Menzies winning power for the sixth time in a row. White Australia is safe in his hands. But soon the furor over a five-year-old will expose the racism of the system and embarrass the government. It's 1964 and this little girl is about to shake the foundations of white Australia. Nancy Prasad's parents have been deported to Fiji after overstaying their visas. So Nancy's living with her sister Shashi and brothers Roy and Sam in Sydney. Seeing the conditions that my parents and the family were uh, living in Fiji after being deported from here uh, really broke her heart. Nancy's older brothers and sister are married to Australians, so they're allowed to stay. But Nancy faces deportation. Her sister and her brothers began to mount a publicity campaign to keep Nancy in Australia. And her sister announced that she wanted to adopt Nancy. Nancy's parents claimed that it would be terrible to return Nancy to Fiji because she would be doomed to a life of poverty. Thank you, like to stay here. I wouldn't go back to Fiji. Stay here. Why not to stay here for? Because I like, I like here. So I like to stay here. And I want to go to school. But in Canberra, Hubert Opperman, the Minister for Immigration, is not about to roll over. The Immigration Department were outraged by the audacity of the Prasads uh, and their willingness to utilise the media. So they believe the whole thing is a setup to get the whole family here in Australia. And they are firmly committed 
to not allowing that to happen. They're very fearful that that kind of public back down would really undermine the integrity and the authority of the Australian government. The family fear that Nancy's days in Australia are numbered. Every time we see a government vehicle in our street, we automatically took it that it was from the immigration department and looking for Nancy. Uh, we were really paranoid about that. They are prepared to take drastic action. And are you confident that you can keep her from the officials for the necessary time? We're going to do our best. As soon as the officials, we feel they're getting close to us, we shall move from one address to the other. The Prasads are on the run, but help will now come from a man who has a growing reputation for fighting racial injustice. The public acclaim for Charles Perkins, Aboriginal leader and university graduate, has been widespread. One American Negro writer has called him the Martin Luther King of Australia. In February 1965, Charles Perkins gains notoriety when he leads the Freedom Rides to highlight discrimination against Aboriginal people who were still not included in the census. Now, the outspoken leader shifts his focus to the plight of Nancy Prasad. Charlie Perkins was the uh head of the uh, student council at the time. Very nice man, very educated person, and, and a good friend. And he was willing to uh, uh, help us out, and we accepted his help. But just how Charles Perkins plans to help is kept a closely guarded secret. Meanwhile, a date is set for Nancy's deportation. There's a lot of bad publicity, but Immigration Department and uh, Hubert Opperman are determined that Nancy will leave. We really didn't want Nancy to go. She was very fond of us and wanted to remain in Australia. We are very worried. Couldn't really comprehend that the government was going to that extent of uh, removing a little child from a family environment that loved her. The 6th of August, 1965, the day of Nancy's deportation has arrived. Sam drives his little sister to Sydney Airport. And it was a very nervous trip from home to the airport, crying that hopefully nothing goes wrong here. Charles Perkins has organised students to protest Nancy's deportation. Amidst the chaos, he joins the family for a photo call. But suddenly, he kidnaps Nancy. I've never been you know, picked up and run by a stranger. It all happened very quickly. So it was for one minute I was there and the next minute, you know, in his car, so. Yeah, I don't think I had a huge amount of time to react. Perkins takes Nancy out of reach of the authorities and into hiding. shocking and dramatic and was very embarrassing for the Australian government. Two hours later, Nancy turns up safe and sound and it turns out that this whole thing was a setup. It was absolutely scary. Anything could have gone wrong and I would have been the one to face the uh, consequences. I feared that I could be behind bars. All the parties involved with the agreement of Nancy's sister 
argued that they had been trying to reinforce to the Australian public, you know, the injustice of Nancy's removal and to reinforce the fact that the white Australia policy had to end. I feel very strongly about it personally because it is a colour question. Nancy is being deported on the basis of one criterion alone and that's colour. And this is, this is bad and uh, immoral as far as I'm concerned. When the man picked you up and ran away with you, were you frightened? Were you worried? No. Did you know him? No. Huh? Weren't you worried at all? When he ran fast? No. Oh, you are a brave girl. <laughs> Tell me, had somebody told you you might be picked up? No. Aha. That's the way. The very week that Nancy avoids deportation, sparks fly inside Sydney Town Hall. They may not be in government, but the ALP opposition is furiously debating whether to end their official commitment to the white Australia policy. Some branches say that the term white Australia should be removed from the party platform because it tends to discriminate perhaps too strongly against race and colour. And so we see many of the younger generation of ALP politicians, such as Gough Whitlam, uh, such as Don Dunstan, trying actively to get the ALP to change its policy. Adelaide University graduate John Menadieu is at the meeting. He's landed the job of private secretary to the deputy leader, Gough Whitlam. People are such as Whitlam, such as Dunstan, if I could say modestly myself, we were of a younger generation, we were professional, uh, and we saw the need for change. So it, it, it clearly was a generational change. Unlike the Liberals, who have a philosophical commitment, Labor's platform has had a written pledge to keep Australia white since the early 1900s. Dunstan and co are determined this must change. But the old guard, including party leader Arthur Caldwell, stand in their way. Caldwell sees that his party is being destroyed from within by people he calls long hairs, uh, rat bags, do-gooders. These people were destroying the party, destroying the principles upon which the Australian Labor movement had been built. And he saw it as a fundamentally uh, a slight at him, fundamentally a challenge to his authority. That was a major problem for Arthur Call, a very generous man uh, in so many respects, uh, but he believed that uh, Australia would be making a major mistake uh, to take Asian migrants on any worthwhile scale. I remember very clearly how upset he was. Dunstan desperately tries to convince Caldwell that change must be made for the sake of the party's image and that reforming the party platform will not mean a flood of non-white immigrants. Finally, a reluctant Caldwell backs the proposal. Put the resolution all in favour say aye. aye. Against, it's carried. The whole atmosphere and the discussion was that uh, a major change had occurred Arthur was not happy, but uh, responsibility on these issues had passed to another generation, even if he had to reluctantly accept it. It may be a landmark decision, but it can't have any impact on Australia's immigration policy until the ALP eventually gain power. Meanwhile, just 24 hours after the kidnap stunt, any hopes of Nancy staying in Australia are dashed. The government refuses to back down and orders her immediate deportation. Nancy says goodbye to the only home she's ever really known. It was heartbreaking. We knew Nancy had a uphill battle going to Fiji. She couldn't speak the language, so she'll be completely out of place. 
As Nancy arrives at Sydney Airport on the 7th of August 1965, the authorities are out in force. There are a lot of policemen there. There was a lot of people. I think they were making sure that I got on that flight. They weren't going to have that same incidents happen as it did, you know, the day before. I'm feeling for myself there. Seeing that plane take off, that's what I'm feeling. It's A little five-year-old, you know, having to go to that, to those lengths, uh, and being deported simply for her colour, you know. Just five months later, the man who oversaw Nancy's deportation finally retires as prime minister. I couldn't see myself saying to the people of Australia. I want you to give me another turn. As Robert Menzies, the chief guardian of the white Australia policy, steps aside after 16 years, momentous change suddenly seems possible. Australia Day 1966. There's a new man in the lodge. Harold Holt, a former Minister of Immigration, decides to take a fresh look at Australia's immigration policy. Holt is looking to make his mark as the new leader. He's trying to present an image of himself as, as youthful and in touch with, you know, a changing Australia and changing circumstances. Holt announces that Australia will open its doors to six and a half thousand highly skilled Asians every year. It's the first time in the nation's history that such a commitment has been made. But right away, the Minister for Immigration, Hubert Opperman, reassures the public the trickle will not become a flood. The changes are not intended to meet general labour shortages or to permit the large-scale admission of workers from Asia. There is no departure intended from the principles of our immigration policy and the basic aim of preserving a homogeneous population will certainly be maintained. The government hopes to rebrand Australia's racist image abroad without disrupting the fabric of Australian society. Ultimately, Holt has no interest in ending the White Australia policy. Indeed, it can be argued that the changes of 66 are about saving and perpetuating the policy rather than beginning to pull it down. Nobody runs around and says, hooray, the old witch is dead, no more White Australia. When people from Asia sought to migrate to Australia, they were not told, sorry, that's not possible. They were told, fill out this form. The chance of actually being admitted to this country was very small. It's business as usual for the Immigration Department in the late 1960s. Britons have always been Australia's immigrant of choice. And now they're wanted as much as ever. George Kiddle has spent 20 years as an immigration official and is now Chief Migration Officer in London. We were selecting 70,000 assisted migrants a year. I can remember the Minister Snedden used to come around, come over overseas every year in the summer, and it dropped to 55,000 one year, and he came over the next year and grabbed me by the, <laughs> the pelt of my suit and shook me and said, now get that back up to that level. The Brits keep on coming, and Australia keeps clinging to the white Australia policy. But ironically, it is this special relationship with the motherland that exposes the undeniable racism of the system. Right into the 1970s, the Australian government still privileges 
British migration through the assisted migration scheme, the so-called 10 pound palms. In early 1970s, uh, a British citizen by the name of Jan Allen applies for the assisted passage scheme and is denied. On the face of it, it is peculiar. He's a computer engineer. The Australian economy requires his skills at that time. He had received glowing reports from immigration officials. The only reason he wasn't offered an assisted passage like many other migrants from Britain were, was that he was black. It demonstrates how far the issue of race has moved on and how far behind Australia is in 1971. After seven long decades, the white Australia policy is still alive and kicking. But in the summer of 1972, change is in the air. Gough Whitlam leads Labor to a landmark victory on the promise of sweeping reform. The ALP has a mandate for radical change to Australian society more than just about any other new government in Australian history. Once a backbench radical, now Whitlam has the power to end the white Australia policy and abandon the ideology that has been the bedrock of political thinking for more than 70 years. Whitlam was always very clear that uh, as leader and if they won government, Labor would remove racial discrimination uh, from the statutes. He was always very explicit about that. From that time onwards, it was illegal to discriminate on racial grounds. But Whitlam needs somebody to spruik the new message. A flamboyant Queenslander of Irish and Spanish descent is the perfect choice. If Gough Whitlam was looking for an individual who could most aggressively throw himself into the, the portfolio of immigration and, and really set the cat amongst the pigeons and show that the, the, the entire game has changed now, he couldn't have selected better than when he selected Al Grasby. That when migration began here on January the 26th, 1788, all Australians were black and the first migrants were white and not very well selected, I might say. <laughs> <laughs> Grasby launches himself into a publicity tour of nearby Asian nations who have, who have been seriously irritated in the last 10, 15 years by the white Australia policy. And he makes it as abundantly clear as he possibly can that that's, that's old Australia and it's over. And when he gets to the Philippines, he announces that white Australia is dead and he says, give me a shovel and I'll bury it. The words are bold but the government needs to signal that things have really changed. The opportunity comes on live television, as Grasby is asked about a certain Fijian girl deported from Australia eight years before. I don't know if you remember the matter. She was a five years old little girl, Nancy Prasad. Uh, would the minister be prepared to uh, reconsider this case? How old is she now? She's 13. 13. Well, uh, if, he, if he's as still as nice as she was when we deported her when she's five, I'd be delighted to welcome her back. God bless Mr. Grasby. <laughs> I think it was the most amazing moment in my life when I heard that. That was incredible. You're happy about the position now where you can go back and live in Australia, are you? Yeah, I'm overjoyed. <laughs> Nancy's return is great PR, but the truth is, her case doesn't herald a new era of Asian immigration. Even though Grasby had said white Australia was, was dead and buried, you'd have to ask yourself the question, was it really buried or just sleeping? Because when you look at the changes that were taking place under, under Whitlam's government, there was a lot of 
grand symbolic announcements being made. But when you when you actually look at the the numbers of immigration and you know, and where the immigrants were coming from, there was no great degree of change. The white Australia policy may have gone, but it will take the fallout from the Vietnam War to prove if it's really over in practice. With tens of thousands of Vietnamese fleeing the new communist regime in 1975, the Australian government will soon be tested. It's at Guam, America's island fortress in the central Pacific, that the majority of South Vietnam's war refugees have found sanctuary. Australian immigration officials were among the first on the scene at Guam. It was a giant United States base, military base, it was a tent city with thousands and thousands of people who'd been flown in from Vietnam and who were being processed for onward movement. Well, the people we've had contact with so far have largely had strong family commitments in Australia, uh, mostly wives and children of Vietnamese who've settled in Australia and a number of parents of Vietnamese. After its decade-long involvement in Vietnam, Australia is expected to help in Guam and beyond. But in Canberra, John Menadieu, now secretary to the Prime Minister, sees firsthand the lack of action from his boss. There were some groups that were vulnerable in Vietnam towards the latter period of the Whitlam government who deserved our protection and we did not give it to them. While Gough Whitlam was prepared to end decisively the White Australia policy, when it came to accepting large numbers of migrants from the Asia region, he, he balked. Out of 96,000 stranded Vietnamese refugees, Whitlam agrees to take just 1,000. For those on the ground, it's a tough directive. Well, it wasn't in my power to change the Prime Minister's uh, position on Vietnamese. I felt disappointed and some guilt as an Australian that we weren't going to do more for uh, former allies. Um, as a public servant, it was my duty to implement the government's policy. Canberra's response seems meagre. The truth is, there are politics at play. Whitlam fears the refugees fleeing communism won't vote for a left-wing Labor government. The experience that Australia had had of refugees from communism, from the Baltic countries, uh, were a thorn in the side of the Labor Party for many years. So I think it, the attitude of the party, Labor Party at that time was Vietnamese refugees coming to Australia could represent a significant and very hostile opposition to Labor. But frankly, a political view, they won't vote for us. Now, one of the most dramatic events in Australian history will have an unforeseen impact on the story of the immigration nation. On the 11th of November, 1975, the Governor-General dismisses the Whitlam government. The proclamation which you have just heard read by the Governor-General's official secretary was countersigned Malcolm Fraser. Amidst the controversy, the top job is seized by Liberal leader Malcolm Fraser. Who will undoubtedly go down in Australian history from Remembrance Day 1975 as Kerr's Kerr. It will be the conservative Fraser who writes the final chapter in the story of how the white Australia policy is finally buried. Fraser's first challenge will come when five young Vietnamese men sail into Darwin Harbour. 
Anzac Day 1976 and a tiny fishing boat is about to sail into the history books. The first Asian boat people are on their way to Australia. The first few days we get worried and we get scared and worried so much. Don't know where we go, what the life. And after a few more days, we think, don't think too, too far away. We have enough fuel, water, food. So we keep going. His future under threat, 19-year-old Tak Tam Lam flees the communist regime in Vietnam. With four friends, he escapes onto the high seas. Using nothing but a school atlas to guide them, they fearlessly consider sailing thousands of kilometers to Australia or America. American people, no friendly people. We know during the Vietnam War, we know. So on the Australian Army is very friendly, we know, yeah. Fond memories of Australian soldiers convinced the boys to head here. After two months at sea, they finally make it to Darwin Harbour. Pulling up next to a prawn trawler, they ask local fishermen what to do. There's a call the police, public phones there. So my, my brother, we don't have money. Uh, so they, they give my, my brother a 10 cent there. Girl call there. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, my brother got to make the phone call to call the police. And my fisherman, uh, my friend's fisherman, he died for three weeks, no cigarette on the boat. And so the fisherman smoked me. So with the body leg, we asked him to <laughs> cigarette. And the fisherman showed the whole pack of cigarette to him and said, yeah, for you. Yeah. So I said, oh, Australia people very good, eh? Only one, but they give whole pack. <laughs> I mean, very good country. That's not the country we like. <laughs> the locals may be welcoming but immigration officials are panic-stricken. The authorities think even five boys and one boat could cause public alarm. In his latest mission, Wayne Gibbons is ordered to Darwin to hush things up. But well, we kept the arrival of the boat, that first boat, um, into Darwin um, as low-key as we could. We didn't want to spook Australians boat arrivals directly into Australian territory risked creating an atmosphere that things were out of control. When the Australian public feels things are out of control, they generally turn against immigration. The government has managed to keep this first arrival under wraps. But just two years later, Prime Minister Fraser faces a crisis on an entirely different scale. There are now hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing Vietnam, and several hundred boat people have already made it to Darwin. Vietnamese refugee boat number 48 arrived in Darwin yesterday with 113 people on board. Immigration department officials have completed preliminary checks on the refugees and are now awaiting a decision on whether they'll be taken to a quarantine station for detailed health and immigration procedures. Meanwhile, the refugees remain on their listing boat, which will eventually join the dozens of others lying in and around the Darwin Harbour. Canberra dispatches Wayne Gibbons to Malaysia to set up refugee camps and stop the boats from coming directly to Australia. You would see them arrive with no standing room on the deck, and that looked awful. But when you opened the hatch and looked below, and you saw hundreds, sometimes, of people just stacked like sardines, literally like sardines. There was no room to move. How people survive those journeys was amazing. The exodus from Vietnam shows no sign of slowing down. The Nguyen family fought against the communists. Now, like many others, they must flee. 
we were listed as the public enemy number one. We are the most dangerous elements of the new society. We are uh, scoundrels, we are scum of the earth, and we must be sent to labor camps. That is when mom decided that at any cost, we must escape. Like all Vietnamese, Fong's family are forbidden from leaving the country. But the government is pushing out the ethnic Chinese. And so the Nguyen's assume false identities and escape on a packed ship. Mum was carrying with us nothing but a little statue of Our Lady. It was, that's it, and, and nothing. No clothing, just what we wear. And we're leaving our country. But the only thing is, I'm happy if we die, if we perish, at least we, as the whole family, we die together. For the developing countries of Southeast Asia, the influx of hundreds of thousands of refugees is an intolerable economic burden. But with a start... July 1979, and there are now 400,000 refugees in Southeast Asia looking for a new home. Malcolm Fraser has a momentous decision to make. If he opens the doors, he not only risks the backlash of a deeply fearful nation, he will overturn an ideology that has barred Asians from Australia for more than 70 years. If Malcolm Fraser had decided that he wouldn't take Indo-Chinese refugees until he had consulted opinion polls or focus groups, he would never, and Australia would never have taken Indo-Chinese refugees. But Malcolm Fraser didn't take polls. He decided that leadership was essential. It was something that Australia had to do, morally justified, and it would be the benefit of this country if we did so. In July 1979, Fraser agrees to take 14,000 Indo-Chinese refugees. Ultimately, 70,000 will settle here during his time as Prime Minister. <laughs> Fong Nguyen's family arrive into Adelaide at Christmas in 1979. Everything was so strange, everything was so different. But on the other hand, we're so glad, we are so relieved from the refugee camp to finally, this is our new home. In, in my mind, there's no doubt that the decisions made by Fra the Fraser government literally changed the face of Australia. We had never had such an injection of Asian migrants to the country, uh, not since the gold rush days. I think their acceptance and their settlement is one of the great success stories of, of Australian migration history. It was the Fraser government's decision to allow tens of thousands of refugees from uh, Vietnam to come to Australia that really marks the end point of the white Australia policy. The watershed event of the Vietnamese refugee crisis has never been repeated. But for the past 30 years, the agenda has still been dominated by stories of unplanned arrivals. We will decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. Australia has no obligation under international law. Australians are concerned when they see boats on our horizon and they want to make sure that the government is actively managing to protect our borders. Boat people remain one of Australia's great fears. Although the arrival of unauthorised boats of asylum seekers has always generated extraordinary angst and extraordinary media coverage, the actual numbers coming to Australia have been tiny in absolute terms, on averages, however you want to look at it. Since the Vietnamese refugee crisis, around 20,000 boat people have arrived in Australia.
At the same time, more than three and a half million immigrants have made their home here, without provoking comment and largely with great success. We're a country of migrants. They've transformed the country and we're indebted to them for the great contribution that they've made in helping us to overcome, to some extent, the social suffocation, the insularity, which has bedeviled us as an island country. Australia's probably been as successful as any country in the world uh, in managing its immigration programs and in bringing together a very broad range of different national groups while maintaining harmony to a very large extent. But in celebrating the success of Australia, to never lose sight of the reality of the difficulties and the tensions and the conflicts uh, necessarily involved in mass migration. It's still work in progress. But Australia has made a remarkable journey since 1901, when its political leaders passed draconian laws to protect the dream of a white nation. It's taken a century and more of struggle. But the immigration nation we live in today has been achieved against the odds. We started the century with a, a massive contradiction. You know, these universal values of freedom and tolerance and fairness, but they're being restricted to whites only and white Brits only. Now, finally, in the last 20, 30 years, we've got these still these same core Australian values and characteristics, you know, but now they're not being restricted to any one race or set. Now, anyone from any continent of the world is able to come to Australia and participate in that. And so it's the final realisation of the dream that was begun by a very different set of people with a very different set of, you know, of ways of seeing the world back in 1901. For an interactive version of the Australian immigration story, go to sbs.com.au forward slash immigration nation.